I'm Paul Zigo. This bag of bones here is Chauncey. And this is the final Hellraisery day of Halloween. A mysterious puzzle box that offers the ultimate and sadomasochistic pleasure to anybody who solves it. A dude with pins in his head and a pronounced Marquis de Sade streak. That's Hellraiser in a nutshell. Director Clive Barker's big screen debut dropped in 1986, and it seemed to make critics uncomfortable. Roger Ebert had this to say of the original. This is a movie without wit, style, or reason. The true horror is that actors were made to portray and technicians to realize its bankruptcy of imagination. Ouch. Kitty has claws. Meow. Critics aside, uh, the original Hellraiser managed to turn its $1 million budget into close to $15 million at the box office, spurred on by audiences who loved its mixture of deviant sexuality and body horror. Since then, Hellraiser has produced an astonishing eight sequel and prequel films. Of those eight films, only three ever saw a theatrical release. That makes for five, count them five, straight-to-video films. That amounts to over 13 and a half hours straight of Hellraiser. Clearly, Hellraiser captures some imaginations. I guess mine is one of them. I have, at one time or another, seen all of the Hellraiser films. Most of them were forgotten moments after the credits rolled, but something kept me trudging forward, film after film. Masochism, maybe? It's not something I ever thought that I'd do again. But this is Halloween, goddamn you. I need to know. The people need to know. What the fuck happened to Hellraiser? So stick with me as I wade through this franchise one last time to take a look at what, if anything, these movies have to offer individually and to see if I can make heads or tails of what happened and what continues to happen 30 years later to the franchise as a whole. This won't be pretty, but hang in there. I have such delicious pain to show you. Allow me to show it to you. Hellraiser, 1986. Watching the original Hellraiser now is kind of like looking into a horror time capsule. It's filled to the brim with things that are meant to shock you, but most of it feels a bit dated when looking through modern eyes. So what's the premise? A puzzle box that opens a gateway to some circle of hell where pleasure and pain are pushed to their absolute limit. Husband and wife duo Larry and Julia move into this home previously occupied by the hubby's brother Frank, the last owner of this evil puzzle box. When Larry accidentally cuts himself while moving in, the blood he spills awakens Frank, who I guess was reduced by the box to some kind of dusty puddle and chunks in the attic. The blood is just enough to bring Frank back into the world, but as a desiccated husk of his former self. It's revealed through flashback that Frank and Julia had a steamy affair at one point. It must have been fucking amazing, because on the strength of that one or two fucks, the husk of Frank convinces Julia to start feeding him the blood of other men so they can fuck again. The thing some people will do for the D, huh? Most of the meat of the film is centered around Julia's seduction and killing of men in the attic of her new home, feeding them to Frank, who gets a little more complete with each one. Somehow, Julia does all this while evading the notice of her husband and his college-age daughter, Kirsty. Sorry, I'm gonna... Her name should be Christy, but it's Kirsty. Kirsty who doesn't live there, but she's nonetheless, she's poking around. There's a bunch of sex and uh, quite a bit of almost sex in the movie, but almost nothing I'd call explicit. The film was cut heavily after initially receiving an X rating from the MPAA, and it honestly shows now more than ever. Much of the gore in the film is quickly cut away from. All of the sex is pretty run-of-the-mill by today's standards. I remember as a kid feeling like I was, I was seeing something naughty and adult while watching Hellraiser. Perhaps that's where it landed its hooks into me, so to speak. These days, though, the first movie in the series feels a bit standard. According to Clive Barker, one of the original sex scenes involved, among other themes, spanking. Today, that's pretty tame, but in the 80s, that apparently had to be cut. There's some great gore effects and some very moist makeup effects on Frank that do a good job of making him look like a skinned corpse. There's also this thing, which is, I don't know, part creepy and part fucking hilarious. 
The makeup work on Pinhead and the other Cenobites is great as well. It's just a shame we see so little of them. Pinhead, for all his iconic status, is barely in Hellraiser. He and the Cenobites are basically our finale. His daughter, Kirsty finds out about evil stepmother's ploy and turns the puzzle box and its demonic inhabitants loose on Julia and Frank, barely escaping in the process. And that's really it. A fun but ultimately dated gore film with a dash of kink and a couple heaping spoonfuls of promise. It bears mentioning again what a shame it is that this movie had to be so heavily cut to satisfy the MPAA censors. I have a sneaking suspicion that the film would hold up a little better today with Clive's original cut. Oh well. That's one Hellraiser down and fucking eight more to go. Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, 1988. Part 2 begins with a pretty lengthy montage of stuff from the first movie. That usually isn't a good sign, and Hellraiser 2 actually does it twice. We find Kirsty from the first film locked in a mental hospital, apparently being treated as if she's crazy, after telling the authorities that a bunch of S&M demons killed her dad, uncle, and stepmother. This sets up the second flashback sequence, not long after the first, as she explains what happened again, and we get to watch scenes from the first film again. Whatever. The psychiatric hospital she's kept in is run by a dude who just so happens to be interested in the Hellraiser puzzle box. He also just so happens to be a sadist who tortures the craziest of his patients. He somehow comes into possession of the puzzle box and the bloody mattress from the first film where we saw the evil stepmother Julia die. In a pretty effective and disturbing scene, he puts one of his crazy patients on the mattress and hands him a knife. The patient, who believes his skin is crawling with bugs, begins to like hack away at himself with the knife. Using the, movie's, uh, the first movie's logic, his blood spilled on the mattress where Julia died brings her, uh, brings her back to life. Of course, with no skin. The makeup effects on skinless Julia really shine in comparison to the first movie, and Julia makes a far creepier skinless villain than Frank ever hoped to be. It's a shame that she's only that way briefly, before she's bandaged up from head to toe and ultimately gets her skin back. The movie is at its best during its first half, and it honestly manages to be creepier and more gruesome than the first movie during that time. Unfortunately, the movie devolves over its last half into a cavalcade of bad special effects and what-the-fuck moments. There's a patient at the hospital with Kirsty who is mute and also a wizard at puzzles. Convenient. She gets a hold of the box, summons Pinhead and his gang of Cenobites, who in turn go after stepmom Julia and the evil doctor who summoned her. Everyone ends up literally running around hell, which is represented as an endless labyrinth. It really reminded me of the movie Labyrinth during these scenes, which not only lessened the dread, but kind of filled me with desire for a scene where David Bowie steps out, all glammed up to sing a ballad about having no skin. I saw my baby, and she didn't have no skin. What should I do? Anyway, the movie's final half is a mess of double and triple crosses. Frank from the first movie comes back briefly to menace his niece Kirsty sexually. It's strange that over the course of one year, the MPAA banned a scene from Hellraiser 1 with spanking in it, but gave the thumbs up to a scene in Hellraiser 2 where this incestuous uncle molests and threatens to rape his niece, whatever. Frank is betrayed by Julia in a nonsensical scene before he can seal the deal anyway. Meanwhile, the evil doctor gets made into a Cenobite. I found myself calling him Dr. Stringface, because that's his gimmick, really. He's got string wrapped around his face too tightly. Oh, and his fingers turn into dicks, which in turn open up to produce scalpels and other stuff. Inexplicably, Dr. Stringface kills all of the Cenobites for the first, from the first film, including Pinhead, reverting them all to their former human forms. He announces, I'm taking over this operation. Ha <laughs> ha, get it? Operation, because he's a surgeon? I mean, fuck, man. Who asked for this bloated bag of dicks, and where do they get off killing Pinhead, only to replace him with a total mess? By this time, they clearly knew that Pinhead was the one selling tickets, so why kill him off and replace him with Dr. Stringface McDickfingers? Ugh. After a few more double crosses and more fruitless running around the maze, the puzzle chick faces down with the devil who in Hellraiser is apparently known as Leviathan, Lord of the Labyrinth, or LOL for short. He's just a giant puzzle box floating above the maze. Whoop-de-goddamn-do. 
This sequence doesn't hold up at all visually. It's just ugly and boring. I mean, this is Hellraiser. I wanted the devil to be some big fat bondage monster with like 80 nipples all clamped and a dozen mouths all ball gagged and 666 assholes all plugged. Of course, Puzzle Chick solves the puzzle box with Kirstie's help and poof, we're done. But wait, the bloody mattress produces this ugly pillar of cheap looking crap at the end for a head scratcher of finale. Only two movies deep, and Hellraiser is bordering on complete nonsense. Next, Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, 1992. Hellraiser takes a break from Kirstie and her tortured family in this third installment. Now, Kirstie does make a quick cameo, but the movie really centers on reporter Joey as she digs into a murder mystery with the help of a mysterious club girl named Terry. Her investigations lead her to the boiler room, this early 90s goth-themed nightclub run by J.P. Monroe, the quintessential rich 90s douche bro. J.P. is an art collector, and wouldn't you know it, he's in possession of the pillar of nonsense from the end of part two. I guess Pinhead isn't dead after all. He wakes up from his slumber to eat this bimbo from the club that J.P. just finished banging. Guess Pinhead doesn't mind sloppy seconds. He, of course, convinces J.P. to keep feeding him chicks, but wait, the plot thickens. At the same time, reporter Joey has recurring nightmares about her father dying in Vietnam, and they begin to be invaded by Pinhead before he was Pinhead? So now there's two Pinheads, a good one and an evil one. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. At the very least, Pinhead is front and center in this film. All of the best scenes involve him, and he's given tons more dialogue. It's a shame that it took two films for them to figure out to up the Pinhead dosage, And it's an even bigger shame that this is the movie they did it in. Joey's investigation ramps up and eventually culminates in all of her friends being turned into Cenobites by Pinhead. None of the original Cenobites make much of an appearance here. They're all replaced by our new and improved Generation X Cenobites. Get out of here, chatterer, you creepy and effective loser. You're replaced by the evil mustachioed camera head. Ready for your close-up, bitches? Don't worry, the other new Cenobites are just as cool. Prepare to piss your pants at the horrifying CD face. He throws CDs like ninja stars. Remember JP, the club owner? Well, now he's the truly blood curdling piston head, I guess. Relax, baby. This is better than sex. Cower in gibbering fear at, I, I don't even know what to call this guy. Barbed wire fatty. Anyway, he was once a bartender, he carries a cocktail shaker filled with gasoline, and he breathes fire. What a horrible concept. All of them are. The Cenobites in Hellraiser 3 feel cartoonish in a way that they never have in previous installments. I half expected the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to show up and fight them. All of the thick, dread-laden atmosphere of the first two films is gone here in favor of blandly presented action, lame makeup effects, and hammy performances. It almost feels like Hellraiser the action movie towards the end as the battle spills out onto the streets and pointless explosions blow up a few city blocks. Remember earlier when I said that there are now two Pinheads? Well, the finale is a showdown between Pinhead's soul, I guess, and Pinhead's evil, which is explained to be so vast that it doesn't even need to be Pinhead to be Pinhead anymore. If you're confused, don't worry. It just makes no sense. The whole Pinhead v. Pinhead showdown takes place in a dream world inside April O'Neil's head anyway. Eventually she wins, or I guess she dreams she does, and buries the evil puzzle box in some wet concrete at a construction site. The final shot shows the interior of a a skyscraper decorated like the box. Hellraiser 4 Hell Lobby? I guess we'll see. Now, before we move on to the fourth installment, I'd like you all to know that I have cracked the code of the original Hellraiser trilogy. All three of these first films have a runtime of exactly 93 minutes apiece. There is no way that this is coincidental. Nine minus three is six. Three films, three sixes. Six, 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 the number of the beast. The number of law, Lord of the Labyrinth. I'm on to your tricks, Hellraiser. Got your number now. Hellraiser Bloodline, 1996. I really, really began to regret my decision to watch and review all these movies right at the beginning of this one. The sheer weight and length and girth of this task that I've chosen has really begun to set in now. How? How are there nine of these? What the fuck needs to be said at this point? 
apparently five more movies worth. Hellraiser 4, or Bloodline, is actually three movies in one. It's like there was a disagreement on when this installment should take place. Hellraiser in the future. No, no, we need another present day Hellraiser. No, again, we need a Hellraiser set in 18th century France. Well, why not do all three and sandwich them into one incoherent mess? I'll tell you why not, because it's gonna suck. Sorry, I was just playing the role of the guy that should have been in on these production meetings. What we get is a single Hellraiser movie that takes place in 1796, 1996, and 2127. No shit. Bloodline focuses on the family tree of the man who originally made the Hellraiser puzzle box, or as I like to call him, the guy you never wondered about. Well, lucky us, because we get to learn about three different generations of his boring ass family, spanning over 300 years. Sound like fun to you? Forget that, does it sound like Hellraiser to you? Uh, yeah, me neither. In 18th century France, a toy maker completes the evil puzzle box for an eccentric French nobleman who's into the occult. That nobleman uses the box and his ridiculous powdered wig to summon Angelique, a female demon. The demon and her helper, an assistant to the rich nobleman, team up and kill the nobleman and the toy maker, informing him that his bloodline is forever cursed because he made the box. Oh no, that probably means we have to hear about them. In 1996, a descendant of the toy maker, played by the same actor, makes a skyscraper inspired by the box. I guess this is supposed to be the building where the reporter buried the box at the end of three. The demon Angelique is still alive, and after killing her boyfriend, she makes her way to America to see what's shaken with this downtown puzzle box apartment community. She finds the original box sealed in a concrete pillar in the basement and tricks a security guard into solving it, which summons Pinhead. Now, Pinhead and Angelique have a disagreement on how things should be handled by demons. Angelique prefers the old school technique of subtle manipulation, while Pinhead just wants to skip directly to experiencing the flesh or whatever. Despite their disagreements, they agree to team up in order to stop the to toy maker's descendant from digging any further into the puzzle box and how it works. He's apparently, without knowing it, getting close to creating a new puzzle box, a puzzle box of goodness and light that could close the doors to hell forever. It involves mirrors that bounce light around eternally. I'm pretty sure that's not how it works. You'll be happy to hear that Camerahead and CD Face are gone now. They're replaced by just one Cenobite, who's actually twisted together from a pair of twin brothers, uh, security guards in the building. It's a bit lame, but honestly, it's a better concept than any of the new Cenobites we got in part three. In addition to the twisted twins, Pinhead now has a dog, I guess, a hellhound. It's just terrible puppet that he sends after people. Great, really scary. At any rate, the toy maker's descendant is eventually killed before his new good guy puzzle machine can take effect. But fear not, his wife uses the original puzzle box to send Angelique and Pinhead back to hell. See, th that's where the movie should end, but we're in the future now, with a, yet another descendant of the original toy maker. He summons Pinhead, who's set loose upon the space station with his hellhound and a new Angelique Cenobite. This last part of the movie is presented as little more than a really bad, really short slasher flick. It's like they didn't know how to sandwich another story in, so they just settle for people getting chased around the space station and killed one by one. At the end, the toy maker's great, 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 great grandson reveals that the entire space station is a good guy cube like his ancestor was trying to build back at the skyscraper. He tricks Pinhead with a stupid hologram, escapes, and activates the cube, permanently sealing the gateway to hell and killing Pinhead once and for all. What a triple-decker shitburger this one is. Why they tried to cram three distinct movies into one film that's actually shorter than any of the previous entries is beyond me. Any one of these stories fleshed out would have made for a better focus for a Hellraiser movie. How are they gonna continue the series, you might ask? Pinhead's permanently dead, the gateway to hell permanently closed, but don't worry, none of that happens until 2127. Present time is still wide open for this franchise to be further abused and further cheapened. Hellraiser Bloodlines is the last Hellraiser film to get a theatrical release. As far as the franchise has fallen up until this point, at least it hasn't been zero budget, straight to video fare. Until now, God help us. 
Do I look like someone who cares what God thinks? And now we delve into the true horror. Hellraiser has five, that's right, five direct-to-video sequels. Lucky for us, or I guess for me at least, there isn't as much to say about them. From what I've been able to find out, four of the five of these franchise sequels started out as projects that had absolutely nothing to do with Hellraiser. The Puzzle Box, the Cenobites, and Pinhead were all just sandwiched in to try and sell these otherwise unsellable films. The franchise was used in an attempt to boost half-assed ideas, enough to throw them out for release, and boy does it show. You'll see. Without further ado, let's devour this shit sandwich once and for all. Hellraiser Inferno 2000. Inferno follows Detective Joseph Thorne. He's one of those dirty detectives. He steals drugs from crime scenes to feed his personal habits. He cheats on his wife, and he generally presents himself as an unlikable, controlling, smug, dismissive asshole. At a murder scene, he finds the Lament configuration. That's the canonical name for the Hellraiser puzzle box. And he takes it home because he's fascinated with puzzles and how to solve them. I mean, do I even need to continue? In brief, he opens the box and begins to have bizarre hallucinations. He gets molested by a couple of disfigured women. He gets chased around by a monster, amongst other lameness. During his mental breakdown, he's also chasing after the suspect in the murder where he found the box. The serial killer he's chasing calls himself the Engineer. Now, I know this wasn't the intent, but every time they mentioned the killer in this movie, I thought of a fat little train engineer with his conductor's hat and his overalls. I mean, maybe they should have run with it, because as it stands, the engineer sucks. Detective Thorne attempts to solve this case as his hallucinations get worse and worse. His friends, the few that he has anyway, begin to die suspiciously. This one is really hard to watch, not because of the disturbing imagery, but because of the slow and uninteresting plot. The movie fails to make you care about either of its plot lines because it can't decide how to present them at the same time. We don't care about the engineer or his killings or his cute little overalls. And we don't care about Detective Thorne's descent into madness. Neither plot line is properly justified. So you're just left with a mess, characters you can't care about, a murder mystery that doesn't matter, and a bunch of hallucinatory nonsense. Everything's presented so carelessly, as if the, the filmmakers knew that you wouldn't care and just piled on the gore and the hallucinations to scratch your Hellraiser itch. Needless to say, it doesn't work. What about Pinhead and the Cenobites? Well, it's revealed that Detective Thorne's psychiatrist is actually Pinhead all along. That's right. At the end of the movie, the psychiatrist becomes Pinhead and explains to Thorne that everything that happened in the movie wasn't real. Since the moment he opened the box, it's just been Pinhead fucking with him. The engineer, not real, just a manifestation of Thorne's own cruelty. Thorne is in hell with the Cenobites all along, and I guess he has an eternity of torture to look forward to. He was an asshole anyway, so we don't care. What an ending. Maybe this horrible ending is a warning to us all. Those of us that have chosen to watch all these movies, we're Detective Thorne. We're, we think we're trying to figure out what happened to the franchise, but... We're really just trapped in our own personal hells, watching endless bastardizations of Hellraiser until we break from the mental fatigue. It'd be a more believable twist than the one in Inferno, anyway. I just, I just hope Pinhead turns out to be the mailman in the next one. Hellraiser Hellseeker, 2002. <laughs> this, <laughs> this one wins the worst title award so far. Hellraiser, Hellseeker, what's next? Hellraiser, hella hell from hell. Hellraiser, Hellseeker. I mean, ugh, what a shitty title. What a shitty movie. But hey, Hellseeker at least tries to tie itself in with the original films beyond dropping the puzzle box in someone's lap and having Pinhead show up. You remember Kirstie Cotton from the first three films? Well, she's back, briefly. We see Kirstie and her husband Trevor, happy and in love, taking a nice drive together. Trevor loses control of the car and it plunges into this deep river. He escapes, but he isn't able to save Kirstie, who drowns. Trevor wakes up in a hospital like a month later with a hazy memory, feeling like something just isn't right. He learns that Kirstie's body was never found in the submerged car and that he's a person of interest in her murder. He goes home and watches a home video of himself giving Kirstie the puzzle box for an anniversary present or something. It's here that Hellsaker really starts to feel like Hellraiser Inferno again, and it doesn't really stop till it's over. 
Trevor is plagued by hallucinations as he tries to go on with his day job while still puzzling out what happened to his beloved Kirsty. He's plagued by cops who all think he had something to do with Kirsty's death. He's also plagued with hot chicks. Despite his seemingly low-level cubicle job and obvious mental problems, every foxy lady in the Tri-County area wants to sit on Trevor's face. His boss, uh, an inexplicably hot neighbor, the list goes on, and the movie just becomes a parade of weird sex scenes with Trevor a heartbroken and mostly uninterested participant. Trevor is a bland, boring protagonist, even worse than shitty old Detective Thorne from the previous movie. If you disliked Thorne, you're going to despise Trevor and his one-note, perpetually confused performance. Trevor wanders around the movie having flashbacks and hallucinations that seem to challenge the nice guy persona we're presented with. As much as it pains me to say it, this one has an almost identical ending to Inferno. Trevor is brought to the morgue to identify a body pulled out of the river by police. He thinks it's going to be Kirsty, but it turns out, it's him! Dun dun dun! He, like Inferno's Detective Thorne, has been in hell this entire time with Pinhead, who's been psychologically torturing him all along. It's revealed that he was actually an asshole to Kirsty, not the nice guy he remembers. He even convinced her to open the puzzle box in hopes that it would kill her so that he could go be with his mistress. That plan, though, backfires when Kirsty strikes a deal with Pinhead. Five souls in exchange for her own. Trevor's soul was, of course, one of them, and he gets to spend an eternity in hell along with the rest of us who watched this horrible movie. Hellraiser Debtor, 2005. Okay, Hellseeker, pass that worst title trophy over to Hellraiser Debtor. Debtor? What the fuck? I mean, look, let's just brainstorm some titles real quick. Hellraiser, Born Again. Hellraiser Flesh Render. Hellraiser 22, Eternal Torturoo. I mean, pretty much everything but Debtor works better. Just try it. Hellraiser Wet Paper Towel, yep. Hellraiser Melted Milk Dud, yep. Hellraiser Broken Toilet, yep. They're all better than Debtor. Fortunately for us, we get a brand new perspective in Debtor, an angle we've never seen in Hellraiser before. Drum roll, please. It's a spunky female reporter on a weird case who eventually bumps into Pinhead. Fuck! Another reporter story? I mean, can we get anything different? Can we get the female CEO of a major company? No. A garbage man? A helicopter pilot? No, no, no. It's another spunky lady reporter who's willing to do anything for her big story. Amy Klein is sent on a mission by her editor to find out about a strange cult calling themselves debtors. What a shitty name for a gang or a movie. Anyway, the cult has this leader that can seemingly kill people and bring them back to life. Hence, deader, I guess. Blah, 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 Amy investigates, blah, blah, finds a puzzle box, yada, yada, finds the cult. Another obviously non-Hellraiser-related script with a slapdash inclusion of the box and pinhead. I guess deader deserves some props, but only in the context of the two films that preceded it. It has a couple of memorable scenes. At one point, Amy Klein is stabbed through the gut. She thinks it's a hallucination, but it just never stops bleeding and she never dies. She has to spend a couple of scenes hiding the blood from people in public. Look, it's an interesting concept, I guess. Trying to look normal with this endlessly gushing gut wound. I, I don't know. Maybe by this point, my mind was trying too hard to find anything, something to latch on to. Detter is as dry as an old cat turd for most of its runtime. Yeah, there's gore, and if that's all you're after, you might like it. If that's all you're after, you might like all of these. There's barely any Hellraiser in Detter. Amy solves the box and summons Pinhead, who kills the cult and tries to take Amy's soul. She then kills herself, and the Cenobites disappear back to hell! Boo! Boo! Hellraiser Hellworld, 2005. Hellworld follows a group of friends who all play World of Hellraiser Craft or some shit together. Some shitty online RPG based on the Hellraiser mythos. The group has been strained because of the suicide of a mutual friend a couple years back, but they decide to get together again because the video game Hellworld is running a promotion. This big, all-inclusive party for veteran players of the game. 
I'm not sure if Hellworld unfolds in a reality where people are aware of the previous films or if Hellraiser is just a shitty MMORPG that everyone plays. I think it's the latter, as the earlier films aren't really referenced at all, other than Hellworld being allowed to wipe its ass with Pinhead and the box yet again. Hellworld wasn't a full unrelated script that was converted to Hellraiser at the last minute like the previous three films. It was adapted from an unrelated short story. I'm not sure if that's good news or bad news. I'm going to go with my gut and say bad. Anyway, the gang of friends arrive at a spooky old mansion uh, that's hosting the party. If this group of people had a guild in the Hellworld game, I bet it was called the Unlikables. So they, they all seriously suck. You've got this lame jock douche, perpetually sad blonde girl, a black dude who's just a 24-7 pussy hound, and this annoying British chick who talks like a chimney sweep from Mary Poppins. Oi, it's all right, loves. We're just here to have some Hellraiser fun. I mean, you're just heaped with characters you can't wait to see die horribly. Lance Henriksen is in this movie. Fun fact, Lance was asked to play the role of Frank in the original Hellraiser film, but he turned it down just to give a soulless performance as the owner of the scary old party house and this bullshit. He gives our group of unlikables a private tour of the uh, old house where they ogle a bunch of pickled fetuses, Hellraiser boxes, and other assorted crap. I'd say that he was a totally obvious villain, but Lance's performance barely carries that. He's just bland and boring and unnecessary. After some horrible, hammy lines from Lance, If you need anything, just scream. The friends split up, wander around, and start dying. It's a Hellraiser slasher flick. Penraiser, uh, Penraiser? <laughs> Pin Pinhead only shows up to give witty quips as people die. Is it just a game? Of all the films before it, this one abuses Pinhead the most. In the other films, at least Pinhead is always predictably Pinhead. He's eloquent and blunt, and he's all about pleasure and pain and mockery of traditional Christian belief. In this one, he's like a shitty narrator for the death scenes. Somebody will be killed by a torture device in the mansion. Pinhead will show up and say, how's that for a wake-up call? That's a line from this movie delivered by Pinhead, and it's not alone. Anyway, it ends up being Lance the party host versus perpetually sad blonde girl Chelsea. It's revealed that the host is actually the father of the mutual friend who killed himself years back. He apparently staged this whole party as a way to get revenge on his son's friends for not stopping his suicide, I guess. Who cares? The, the, the host summons the Cenobites, the girl escapes, and we get to move on, finally, to our final Hellraiser film. Hellraiser Revelations, 2011. It's hard to imagine things getting worse than they already are. Well, fire up them imaginations because they save the worst for last. Revelations is actually the first film since Bloodlines to use a script that actually began as a Hellraiser script. Now, you'd think that would mean an increase in quality, but uh, look, I mean, just look at that cover. That's not Pinhead. Doug Bradley, who has always played Pinhead, turned the role down after reading the script. Not a good sign, considering the dog shit he signed up for. They cast this seventh grade math teacher looking dude instead and made the movie anyway. This one really is the worst of them all. It starts as a found footage movie as we see two teenagers go to Mexico for their 18th birthday recording their exploits on a handheld camcorder. One of them accidentally kills a hooker he's banging in the bathroom. Then a vagrant shows up, gives them the puzzle box. One of them solves it, summons bootleg Pinhead, and gets dragged to hell. He then convinces his friend to keep bringing him hookers so he can consume them and return back to life, just like in the first couple of movies. That really is what Revelations is trying to do, recapture those first couple of movies. The problem here is that everything that was good in the first couple of movies now sucks. The characters suck. The setting sucks. The acting, design, and pacing all suck. The Cenobites suck. Even Pinhead, good old reliable Pinhead, now sucks. Finally, after nine films, the Hellraiser franchise is a dried up husk. Everything interesting, entertaining, titillating, or provocative has been completely sucked out of it. It's a zombie now, unaware that it's dead, unable to die, unable to do anything but drag its desiccated corpse behind the pack of better franchises and more interesting horror concepts. 
The real victim here is Pinhead. He was the most interesting thing about Hellraiser, and the series slowly digested him over the course of nine movies and shit this out. No other villain, no other horror villain has ever been this abused. Not Freddy, not Jason, not Michael Myers. I mean, look, those guys all got their fair ration of shit, but none of them got fucked on to this degree. And that, my friends, is it. What the fuck happened to Hellraiser? It was sold down the river for a cash-in, ripped apart by a studio that didn't care about it beyond its waning ability to get dupes like me to watch it. And I wish, I wish I could tell you that this is over. I wish that we could just bury the bones of this once promising franchise in an unmarked grave somewhere and move on, never to speak of it again. I won't beat around the bush here, though. They're making another one. Hellraiser Judgment, currently slated for a 2017 release. Once again, that's not Pinhead. Not a good sign, but hey, maybe they've learned their lesson. Maybe, maybe this one will be good. Let's read the short description of the plot they just recently released. <clears throat> Three detectives investigate a, a serial killer, only to discover a much deeper threat of otherworldly proportions. Fuck. Fuck!